Hello, everybody. This is Renan Joran, and I'm joined by Andrew Amrinovin. And we are going to cover the topic of design for manufacturing and design for assembly and what engineers need to know when designing a new product. Hi, Andrew. Uh, so what does it mean, design for manufacturing? Hello, Renan. Uh, good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, design for manufacturing is uh, one of the most important uh, design, uh, basically, elements uh, when it comes to designers. Uh, that is where uh, you want to make sure that design is manufacturable, easy to manufacture, and that you want to uh, implement um, a, a system of design so that uh, there's only one way for the user at the end uh, end user to be able to use the product uh, during the uh, manufacturing. Of course, you want to make sure that the, the assembly of the uh, parts are simplified in, and so that there is uh, basically less uh, of a mistake uh, possible, or they call it also mistake proofing uh, the assembly. So that's called design for assembly during the manufacturing. Right. And so you also cover design for assembly. Actually, design for manufacturing usually people say that when it comes to the fabrication of parts and then design for assembly is how to put it together. But really, the correct the principles, the approach is uh, is pretty similar. So let's cover uh, a few a few um, a few things that designers need to keep in mind. And the first one is that when you design custom parts that are not standard off the shelf, they're not available right there, out there in the market. They actually can be fabricated with the process that you have in mind for mass production. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and I think that there are a lot of ways to fabricate parts. There are 3D printing nowadays and, and there are uh, injection molding. Uh, there are many ways to actually fabricate parts, but at the end of the day, uh, you want to simplify the design so that they're easy to be manufactured and easy to be fabricated. Right. At the intended volume, right? So you mentioned 3D Correct. printing versus plastic injection molding. Correct. If you, if you want to make 50 pieces, maybe 3D printing is going to be fine. But if mass production is going to be batch, batches of 10,000, you get to think of um, injection molding, right? Absolutely. Uh, the, the second one is a related point is whenever you can, do not custom design some parts. Whenever you can, if you can find standard off the shelf uh, products on the market, use them and simplify your product. Uh, remove the risks, remove the extra cost, remove the, 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 the time to make the molds and so on and so forth. Uh, do, do you have an example or do you want to go deeper into this? Yeah, and that's correct. Uh, nowadays, a lot of the components uh, and so-called off-the-shelf parts are pretty much uh, approved uh, in terms of technology, in terms of production, and they are very much improved uh, compared to 10, 20 years ago in terms of reliability and quality. So uh, a lot of these uh, uh, and, and you have a lot of different kinds of parts that are standardized nowadays. You have actives, passives, you know, for example, uh, caps, resistors, uh, inductors, as well as ICs, semiconductors. These are all a lot of these, including some connectors that are already off the shelf approved parts. And there are plenty of vendors out there. And a lot of times these parts are readily available and in stock. So there's no need to uh, uh, redesign or reinvent the wheel per se. And you just need to contact the supplier of your choice and uh, get some samples and try it in your design. And then if it works, you can actually get a good deal, cheap, readily available parts right away. Right. So. Um... Obviously, 
if you need a very nice, let's say, enclosure with your own design, uh, you're not going to find that out of, in the market, but especially for internal parts, as much as possible, uh, try to go standard of the shelf, will save you some time, some, uh, some money, and reduce the risk actually quite a bit. Right. Exactly. The next point, um, when you design the product as early as possible, you need to think, okay, how is this could, going to be made with what production process and what's the material going to be? Uh, and some people come to us and they say, well, this is probably going to be some plastic, but aluminum might be okay also and so on. And they, they really haven't thought through this. So the design is far, far, far from complete. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, yes, it does. I, I think that uh, this is where collaboration with different uh, uh, functions within the team is extremely important. Uh, I think designers need to be in touch with the ID department, industrial design team, uh, as well as the program managers, customer requirements. And really, at the end of the day, they need to understand how uh, this product is going to be used at the end. So needs to be designed with the processes and materials that are in hand in mind so that uh, everything will move uh, sm smoothly. Absolutely. The next point is think also of the color and finish. And I'm talking to mechanical designers uh, mostly here. When you do your, your 2D drawings, uh, this should be mentioned on the drawing. Um, if you don't put that down and if you don't already think about it, well, um, this is also related to the, to the process and the material that you need to pick. Uh, if you pick a, a process uh, that's maybe, uh, that, that leads to very porous uh, parts like die casting and you want to anodize it, you will probably, probably run into issues, right? This is just an example. Do you, ha have you run into that? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, point because a lot of times young uh, MEs, mechanical engineers, forget about the color or finish until towards the end. And what happens is that different materials absorb and or reflect color and the finish differently. And uh, uh, you end up having, for example, let's say you have two different kinds of materials and you're supposed mm -hmm. to have one color for both. And then you end up having two tones, two different colors that ID will reject and you'll have delays in product del delivery to market. So it's very important right from the beginning, uh, establish a um, well-known approved vendor for material and, and color and paint uh, so that you can uh, actually get some color chips and materials samples uh, right up front so you can actually get it approved for the project as soon as possible. Yeah, that's a great point, yes. Uh, reduces risk a lot. Exactly. And the last one, and you, you touched on a little bit uh, when you introduced the topic, assembly. Um, you have production operators. They're not university graduates. Uh, they're not going to think deeply about how things uh, have to be put together. It's got to be you know, broken down uh, to the right degree, at least. And it's got to be relatively obvious how to put the parts together, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, assembly is one of the most important parts of the production. Uh, many designers uh, forget the fact that actually uh, there are going to be operators and uh, manual assembly on some of these parts, uh, which can uh, greatly impact the reliability and quality and testing of uh, these uh, assembled units or modules. So it is very important for designers actually be in the assembly line and actually observe how these units are being assembled and they will have a better idea of how to design it next time. Yeah, if possible, um, engineers should put prototypes together themselves and they will have an idea also. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and it's, it's also true for packing. Um, and the same thing. So True. thanks a lot, Andrew. That was a good, uh, good overview of this topic. And let's go into the next one in the next video. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you.